Galatians 4.4 4 says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. It took a while. It took a long time. And today, when we go through this season of Advent, uh, we enter in a very small way into the waiting that God's people did uh, for centuries as they waited for God to fulfill his promise to send his Son. And so we want to enter into that a little bit tonight even, even as we anticipate Christmas coming tomorrow. Uh, and we, we're glad that you're able to be with us this evening. We want to welcome you here. Uh, we hope that everything is working well on your end, that you're settled in to enjoy a time of uh, singing and listening to people play and to sitting under the teaching of God's word. Uh, would you pray with me now as we begin? Father, your timing is wiser than our timing. It's better than our timing. Uh, it happens on a, an infinitely grander scale than ours does. And you are infinitely more trustworthy to make timing decisions than we are. And so we entrust ourselves to you this evening. Uh, we pray that as we join your people through the centuries who have anticipated the gift of your Son, that we would have genuinely thankful hearts, that we now have the opportunity to know him and to receive him and to look forward to his coming again. We do that tonight. We pray that you'd be at work in us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
In Isaiah uh, chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Let's sing together. He shall reign forevermore. to the world. The Lord has come. Joy to the world, the 
Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ, while fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and lied him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angel went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them.
Well, boy, did I catch it on Sunday. I made some kind of offhand comment during the service about Christmas being six days away, and you can't get away with anything when you're part of a pastor's family, especially if you're the pastor. I got home, and I was reminded in no uncertain terms that Christmas was five days away, not six days away. It's one day. I don't know what what kind of difference it makes. You know, is it really a big deal if we celebrate Christmas on Saturday instead of on Friday? Well, if you're eight years old, it does make a big difference. It's kind of like adding an eternity to what's already impossible to wait for. Proverbs 13:12 says, "Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life." Hope deferred, delayed, put off, postponed. We're we're in a season, an annual season of anticipation now. It's one that's been built in uh, by the church intentionally. Uh, over many years, and then it's been built in by culture as Christmas decorations come out right after Halloween, and it sets up this season of long anticipation, uh, a season of anticipation that's culminated with Christmas morning. And I wonder if uh, your anticipation this year has gone a little clunky as a result of what you've experienced this year. If you're anything like me, uh, you've, you've had your share of deferred hopes. And maybe that's made your heart sick. Maybe it's made your heart numb. Maybe it's made you unwilling to, to, to look forward to any desire being fulfilled because you know what it feels like to have that hope deferred again. Of course, we're, we're not the only ones uh, who have been there. Many people have over time, and sometimes we, we can feel this, this experience of a deferred hope in the stories of others, the feeling of interrupted anticipation. We, we feel that in the stories of others, including uh, the pre-Christmas story of Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth. Zechariah was a priest, and we really hear ages of longing echoed in the description that Luke gives us of Zechariah and his wife. He uses Old Testament type language. He says in Luke 1, 6 to 7, they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. These are faithful people. If anybody has good reason to anticipate receiving the blessing of children from, from the Lord, then it's, it's them. And even for faithful people, years of not getting this blessing no doubt would have dampened their ability to expect that they would get it. And yet, as faithful people, they, they kept asking They didn't give up on the Lord. They kept asking at least for the most important things. Asking on behalf of the people was one of Zechariah's jobs. He took his job as a priest seriously, uh, no doubt, uh, especially or in a special way, uh, his duty when he was chosen by lot, we're told in Luke 1.9, when he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord to burn incense That's a big deal. It's a big responsibility. And even then, even when you're given this big responsibility that God himself has set up for priests to take on uh, only on very rare occasions, it, it would be easy to expect that what you're doing is part of a long sequence of continuing to wait. To be surprised when the thing that you do actually actually has a result, actually causes something to happen, or something actually happens while you do it. It would be easy to be surprised when waiting gives way suddenly to receiving. But that's what happens for Zechariah. 
told, starting in verse 10, that the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. You might just pause there and ask, well, which, which prayer is the angel talking about? It's going to become clear that there are two, two prayers that have been heard. One old prayer and one very old prayer. He mentions the old one first in the second half of verse 12. Your wife, Elizabeth, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. We'll see that Zechariah kind of gets stuck there, but the angel keeps going. And he refers to the other prayer that's been answered, the very old prayer. The very old prayer, the answer to the very old prayer is found in the role that Zechariah's son John will fill. 16 and 17 says this, He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Zechariah had joined the centuries of faithful among Israel in in asking God to restore his people. And here it is. Here's the answer. God is about to act. For the time being, though, Zechariah is a little bit distracted. Uh, It seems that that he has gotten hung up on the answer to the old prayer. Maybe a prayer that he had laid to rest a long time ago. A prayer that he doesn't really anticipate would any longer be answered. He has maybe gone on auto-respond with the angel as the angel has, re- has, has described the fulfillment of the very old prayer. And he comes back to the first thing the angel has said. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. How is it possible? After all this, after all these years... Hope deferred had dried up his heart, at, at least at least when it came to this particular hope, this particular desire, this particular thing that no doubt, at least in his earlier years, he had prayed for countless times. Well, the angel had already told him why it was possible. He had already told him, your prayer has been heard. And maybe... Maybe in his attempt to survive the deferred hope, Zechariah had sort of lost track of what he was doing when he was praying. Maybe he had, he had lost his grip on who it was that he was actually praying to. If, if that had occurred to him, if it had occurred to him what he was really doing when he was praying and who he was really praying to, then that, combined with the experience he was having right now, uh, probably would have allowed him to answer his own question. How can I know this? Well, one way that you can know it is that there is an angel telling you. This is not something that happens every day. This is a, a very, very unusual situation. And if, if a messenger is sent from the very presence of God to tell you something that God has said he would do, then that's exactly how you can know that this is going to happen. And yet we see something of the the dried up hopes of Zechariah here. And even the usually faithful sometimes need a reminder. And so God gives Zechariah one here. Speaking through Gabriel, Gabriel reminds him, here's how you can know. I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. 
in his grace, God doesn't take away the promise. And in his grace, God gives Zechariah uh, a bit of a verbal timeout. He says, I'm going to give you some time to reflect, some time to think about this, so that when the time comes, so that when you speak next, you'll be ready to say something that's worth saying. And he does. He says probably the most worthwhile things that he's ever said in his life. When after his son is born, he, we're told in chapter 1, verse 67, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father, Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. His very own son has been born. Out of the dry ground of deferred hope, a tree of life has sprung up for Zechariah and for his wife. Desire fulfilled. And even now, even here, Zechariah knows that where he is is part of something much bigger than him, part of something much bigger than this unexpected, hard-to-believe fulfillment of his own personal desires. The birth of his son sets the stage for that much bigger thing, for the answer to the very old prayer. You may have noticed that when Zechariah prayed, when he prophesied, rather, he said that God has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. Well, that's not Zechariah. David is of the tribe of Judah. Zechariah is of the tribe of Levi. And so there's something going on here that extends far beyond Zechariah or his family or his house. Because it is to the house of David that God has given the older promise the bigger promise, the promise that he would set on the throne of that house a king who would reign forever, who would establish the kingdom of God's people without end, somebody who would save his people from their sins, the sins that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away. Zechariah is part of something much bigger, Something much bigger than him. So, so we might ask, why all the waiting for Zechariah? Why the years that feel like, with regard to having his own son, that feel like hopeless years? Why the dry years? God has his own reasons for doing these things. He doesn't reveal them all. But maybe, in Zechariah's case, and maybe often in our own, it's to prime Zechariah's longing for something greater. To set before him a regular, and in this case, even painful reminder. To remind him over and over again that things are not as they should be. And that, therefore, he should keep asking. Keep asking and not give up. Is there something that you've been waiting for for a long time? Maybe it's Christmas. Maybe it's healing. Maybe it's reconciliation. Maybe it is a more consistently pleasant attitude that you've been asking for over and over and, and you just keep tripping yourself up. 
maybe it's the ability to hug somebody without this sort of abiding fear that you might kill them as a result. Sometimes the Lord keeps us waiting for the smaller things in order to remind us to keep waiting for the bigger things. If the smaller things come now, and and all of them come now, then it would be really easy for us to settle. It would be really easy for us to say to the Lord, Wow, thanks so much. Uh, If we need anything else, we'll, we'll get a hold of you. He has bigger things for us than that. He wants us to keep looking to him for them. He wants us to receive them from him, and he's not going to allow us to settle. He knows. He was the one who told us that hope deferred makes the heart sick but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. And he knows exactly when to fulfill the smallest, simplest hopes. And he knows exactly when to fulfill the deepest, most inescapable longings of the human soul. He knows exactly when the fullness of time has come. He knows exactly when to say to Bethlehem and to the world, The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight, in his own son, at exactly the right time. Father, your word has invited us to take courage, to take heart as we wait for you. You haven't chosen to reveal to us your timing in every case. In fact, in many cases, you haven't revealed your timing at all. The things that you have told us to look forward to, you've told us that we don't know the timing for. We don't know when your son is going to return. We don't know when the things that weigh heavily on us in this world might be resolved. But we want to continue to wait. We want to continue to ask. We want to continue to look because we have the confidence that you have drawn us into your own family by faith in your son, your son that you sent when the fullness of time has come. So we ask these things in his name. Amen. Sometimes our hearts are sick. We feel like we've given up. And when it comes time to sing, O come, O ye faithful, we don't really sing, we don't really feel like we're faithful and that was kind of the story of a young woman who wrote a song and she called it oh come all ye unfaith all you unfaithful and because she was struggling and she couldn't sing the song oh come all ye faithful But she realized that there is hope because Christ is born. Christ is born for us, for each of us. Because of what he does, what he has done, his promise is peace for those who believe. Hopefully, this is a message of hope. It sounds kind of odd, O come, all you unfaithful. But it is a message of hope.
Oh, come, all you unfaithful, come, weak and unstable, come, know you are not alone. Oh, come, barren and waiting ones, weary of praying, come, see what your God has done. Christ is born, Christ is born, Christ is born for you. Oh, come, bitter and broken, come, with tears unspoken. God has done. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born for you. He's the Lamb. God has done. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born for you. Christ is born. Christ is born. Christ is born. For you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. For while we were still weak, at the, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. O oh, holy night. O oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks 
so blessed by what you have done for us that you came to earth as a baby in a manger took on human form Lord you did not remain a baby. You grew and walked among us, took on our sin on the cross and rose again. And you give us new life. And we praise you and glorify you tonight. for this gift that you've given. Oh, Jesus, thank you. We bless your holy name. 